All right, today we're going to be talking about blocking spawns in Hardpoint. You hear pros talking about it, teams talking about it. You even hear the casters on the broadcast mentioning it. But what does it actually mean? So what we're going to do is a little deep dive on what it is to block a spawn and how it actually helps teams inside the game of Hardpoint. So what is blocking a spawn? So blocking a spawn is basically just standing in the area of a spawn point on the map so that your team's influence is on that spawn point rather than the other teams. So if we wanna go more into the logic of what the game is thinking of when you're blocking a spawn, I'll take you through a little example right here. So let's say we're P2 on Hydro and we have three, let's say main spawns, P5, P3, and back P2. So what we wanna do is talk about blocking spawns, specifically on these pushed out spawns. So what we wanna talk about is the logic of actually blocking one of these spawns out. So let's say you're holding P2, so you guys have influence on this side of the map. So let's say you're pushed out here in P5, that means you are now influencing this spawn for your team. And because the logic of the game, you are now going to be spawning your opponents over here. The logic works like this. Since you are contesting this spawn, since your presence in, is influencing in this sphere, it is no longer safe for your opponent to spawn here. So it'll force your opponent to spawn in the other open, safer position for them. Now things become a little bit different once you take into account squad spawns or a mixture of squad spawns and regular spawns, which is what we had last year in MW2. But if you're talking about a more default system like Cold War spawns or similar to just this P2 hardpoint, this was probably the best example in this game of just regular default spawns. You can really see the impact of what blocking a spawn does. So. Let's talk about blocking a spawn versus anchoring a spawn. So anchoring a spawn and blocking a spawn are basically in a subset of like non-overlapping categories where all anchors are spawn blockers, but not all spawn blockers are anchors. So I'll go a little bit more into depth with that. So an anchor, let's say if we're talking about P2, is someone who's blocking the, the close back spawn that you want your teammates to be spawning on to help you out on the hill. So this is, let's say, the anchor that all anchors are spawn blockers because you are blocking this back spawn. However, if we're talking about these more pushed out spawns, you can have a sub that might be playing inside P5, this person, and that is now a blocker, but he's not an anchor. So technically, you know, he is an anchor if you were to spawn on him because this is being contested by the opponent, but I would like to rather call him more of a just regular spawn blocker. This is the anchor, this is the blocker, and then we have a free, area of where the opponents are going to be coming from. So I say this because we use spawn blockers as a way to identify where the pressure is going to be coming from on a hold. So if we have an anchor over here playing inside the hill and we have a spawn blocker over here in P5, we know that they're gonna be spawning in this P3 area so we can adjust our setup to how they're going to be trying to break on the hill. If we can read the pressure that way, it opens up so many scenarios for us to completely full hold the hill because the fewer lanes that we have to watch, the less area that we're gonna actually have to cover with our eyes and direct our focus to so that we can hold the hill uh, and adjust to our opponents that way. So let's say we do have P2 up, we have our anchor in hill playing, so he's blocking this spawn back here. And let's say we just have a setup of one guy back here at the P4 rock, one guy dome, one guy let's say pushed out over here. Let's say this guy that's dubs pushes out and gets into P5 after getting a few kills. He knows that he's blocking this spawn. He knows that they must be spawning in this P3, P1 area. And therefore we can now set up what a lot of teams like to call a funnel. So that's where you are basically directing the opponents to one side of the map and you can now adjust your setup to accommodate the fact that they're only coming from one area of the map. So you can now play crosses, you can now work with your teammates and you can now even hit a little pinch if you wanted to if all the players respond up and influence that way. So the way you can do this is really getting pushed out on the map. A lot of teams, when they would start on a hill, let's say you are starting on that P2 and we end up getting those kills, we would like to play a little bit tight first off, so maybe you're a little bit tighter. And then once we get those kills, we would push off uh, because you're now able to take a little bit more space because the other teams are now coming off of spawn. So now you're, you're pushing up, you're trying to take a little bit more space. And even if you die, there's still a possibility of you getting traded by your teammates and it still stunts their push even more because by the time that they've actually completed all of these fights, 
you're now spawning back up by the time that they would have already been, let's say already P4 or something like that. So it's a really good idea once you get those first initial kills on that first wave to start pushing out and possibly blocking those spawns so that you can direct your focus elsewhere and uh, really funnel the other team towards one side of the map. So the game of Hardpoint really comes down to all info. And if you can get the info on where that pressure is coming from, by blocking as many spawns as possible. Uh, obviously you wanna keep one open so not everything is all chaotic and crazy, people spawning everywhere, but you wanna keep it nice and controlled, you know, block two of the default main spawns and then force them into one spawn so you know where they're coming from. So I actually just recorded this video, but I wanted to mention two more really crucial points. And that's just, you know, if we are blocking the spawn, so like, let's say, we have this setup here that we were talking about before. We have the anchor, we have the blocker. You know, this is a scenario where the blocker also has a really good opportunity to be like an outlet for the rotation to the next hill. So if we're talking about P3 here, he can be that free offset to start rotating well, right away because he's on the other side of the map from the, the hill. So you can see a lot of the times that people that are already pushed out have that easy access to the rotation for the next hill as well. Uh, the other thing that I really wanted to talk about was, you know, countering these people that are blocking. And that's just honestly, instead of trying to force it on the hill, having one guy be that route man, you see that term a lot on the rotation, but it could also be just a, a person taking a route to kill one of the people that might be blocking and completely uh, stopping their setup from actually helping on the break and stopping their enemies from actually funneling them uh, to one side of the map. All right, so here we're going to be taking an example from a hard draw hard point between us and Seattle. This is a few months back, uh, but we'll take a look at this specific P2 situation and how the spawns are working and what's going on here. So as you can see, Seattle is on a breaking opportunity. We're holding one guy dome, one guy P4, one guy in hill. As of right now, no one on Seattle is blocking this back spawn. So I believe the line was around here inside castle. So if you can get up into this position and start looking outwards, you can start blocking this back spawn because it's gonna say, oh, he has influence by looking at that spawn. So you're gonna be spawned out in P5 or P3 because there is that influence from the Seattle player here. So as you can see, once the Seattle player is able to make his way, number one, this is Mac. He's taking the route to block this spawn. So as you see, no one was there at the moment, one six spawn, so he spawns close. Number one gets outside of here. He technically has that line uh, that's being designated. So once Seattle has both sides, we are now spawning out. Now this is a more deeper spawn than usual uh, back here, but Brandon is going to spawn out, but that just means that he is going to be also blocking this P5 spawn technically. So that's why number four spawns here P3. Because he spawned into a spawn point, uh, that's going to be technically blocking this influence for Seattle. So Seattle is going to spawn in a more safer area in P3. Um, and once we get this kill, uh, we would actually, I would assume we would spawn in the back here, but I believe there is some squad spawn influence here and in why Ant spawns out. Uh, maybe it's because number seven is in, in a gunfight, so recognizes he's in danger and is technically uh, gonna block the spawn for us. Uh, or there is some squad spawn element with number eight here. Whatever, it's based on probabilities. So we still are spawning out P5, but we know for a 100% fact that they are gonna be spawning on this side of the map. So this is what we do to play off of it. Number eight is gonna be watching the cross and then look at this play that number six Ant Shotzi does uh, for us. He knows that they have to be spawning P1. So even Dan in Hill and Kyler uh, P4 must know that they're coming from P1 side because they see where their teammates are spawning up. And because they're over here blocking the spawn, contesting it, there's no way for Seattle to be spawning back here. So as you can see here, we make the play to just completely funnel them to this one side of the map. Since we spawned out, since we're in Hill and got the kills near the Hill, we know that they're gonna be dome side. Ant makes a really nice flank play because he knows all four guys on the enemy team are spawned up so that they can't spawn behind Brandon right here until he makes a play and starts killing them. So he makes a play, starts to kill one. Unfortunately for us, <laughs> this backfires because they are all able to coordinate and, and break at the same time. We don't have all the crosses teamed up. So even though this is a good play by Ant, it doesn't work out for us as a, as a whole specifically 
because of that coordination that Seattle had on breaking from the front side. He was just a little bit too late on it. If he had spawned up, let's say right now, and they had still spawned P3, and he was able to start taking this route while these guys were spawning right here, he probably has a chance to completely shut down their push. But I just wanna get you realizing what's going on here, what's going through the mind of both Brandon who's cutting and, and Ant who's making this flank play. Uh, so technically, if one was already dead and he was already here, he's now blocking this spawn. So he, the other team would be spawning P5 here. And that's how calculated this is by Ant because he knows all of them are off spawn. So he can make this play so that one guy doesn't spawn out P5 and starts to kill our guys from behind. In the end, unironically, it actually kind of works out to our benefit because we do all spawn out with 20 seconds left. So it's like we held that first you know, 40 seconds by ourselves, and then we're able to chain into this P3 by setting up easily with the 20 seconds. So, you know, not the ideal hold, but we still got majority points on the hill and then have a rotation for the next one. So let's take a look at another example. This is from New York in the COD Championship Finals against Toronto. They're absolutely blowing Toronto out of the water in this map, but let's take a look at this P2 setup. As you can see here, P2 has just popped. These uh, four guys had all spawned out at the end of the P1, so they were spawning super deep. Paco is in a play now where he was able to get pushed off right at the beginning because of how well they were able to end that P1. So he's already pushed out, technically blocking this P5 spawn. So anyone that dies on Toronto right now at this very moment would spawn out P3. And as you can see here on the New York side, number seven is gonna be the one anchoring the spawns in the back for New York. So Paco not only gets one, but he does get two off being pushed off inside P5 here. And he takes a route where it's it's a super impressive heads up play by him by going P5. So he can first try and help out number six, who's fighting number three here. Number three end up, ends up dying. But now by blocking P3, he knows and his team knows that they are all going to be spawning P5 in this area and that the last guy alive is going to be P5. He plays off of this. He can now go back and go back towards the water and try and flank these guys P5, similar to how Ant was flanking the guys P1 in that last play. He knows that all the guys are spawned up. So he can now take action and actually make this calculation and take this risk by flanking them. Unfortunately, good play by Insight by actually picking him up. But now he knows and he can relay to his team that all of these guys are coming from this P4 side, they can adjust to that. As you can see, number six, Skies here is already playing the cross. He doesn't even need to worry about his P1 because he knows that they are on the other side of the map. And from this, Kismet is now basically cross set up with Skies. They're both gonna be able to teamwork anyone that might be coming through this area to try and break through the front of P2. And then as you can see here, because this spawn is being blocked by Toronto members, this being contested, now New York is going to spawn out as well. It's up to Kismet to stay alive to keep blocking the spawn for the team. And then from there on, Skies can still teamwork with Kiz here. You actually see Skies turn around just for a quick second, just in case number three was taking around through mid and two P1. And at that moment, Paco would not have been able to cover that lane because he was off spawn. But once Paco covers it, he now turns back over his attention towards the P4 to keep helping Kismet out. Once again, they're just completely cross set up because they know Toronto is going to be coming from this area. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little explanation of what's going on with spawn blocks and how you can actually implement them as a team.